Hey everyone, my name is Matt. Welcome to my shop. We are taking a little a couple, what, like a week and a half off from the home renovations. So I am hopping into the shop to, uh, you know, get some actual woodworking done, spend some time in here. And I thought a kind of fun and quick project would be a whiskey or a, a scotch cabinet for a house we're in present for our old neighbors. So we lived across the street from these, uh, these wonderful people for almost 10 years. And a year after we moved here, they moved as well. So I want to make them something to a housewarming type present. And it's a little bit of a kind of a special situation too because I have a whole bunch of slabs from a tree they had removed from their yard uh, nine years ago, I think, or eight years ago, something like that. And this tree has a little bit of a special history for me at least because this is the reason I got into uh, urban logging and urban timber and wood and stuff because it was the, the first one that I ever encountered and it was one that taught me that there's actually really interesting and valuable material inside of these trees which are normally discarded. So it was kind of a fun realization for me. So they had this tree removed because it was kind of, it was coming apart, it was kind of starting to separate and it was, it was a hazard tree. It also had a whole heck of a lot of carpenter ants in it. So they had it removed and it was kind of a sad moment because one of the great things about their property was the tree coverage that they, they really loved. So they were really upset to lose the tree, but they said, hey Matt, you're a woodworker, do you want a tree? And I was like, I guess, <laughs> I guess, I guess those correlate. So that's also the time I bought a chainsaw mill specifically to cut up that tree. So I had brought it to my backyard, I got a chainsaw mill, I got it all slabbed up. And what was absolutely beautiful about this tree is that that splitting action was essentially two stems, I guess. And one side was this incredibly spalted, beautiful thing and the other side was the most curly, ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. So you have interesting colors and elements from the spalting side, and then also just incredible curly and quilted figure on the other side. That really showed me that, hey, uh, these trees actually have something useful inside of them. Before that point, it was all, I guess, the more traditional mentality where the only useful trees for uh, furniture making are the ones you pull out of the forest that have never been exposed to anything other than forest life so i want to make them a uh, scotch cabinet because they're really into scotch and i want this uh this little piece of wood here to be sort of the focal point of it so everything's gonna be built around giving this the most virtual visual interest and then we'll kind of uh make a box essentially to house this this is a, basically just a wall hanging cabinet that just happens to be sized for scotch <laughs> So here is a closer look at that slab. This is a uh, smaller piece. I have almost the entire tree still, and this is the first time I'm actually finally making something out of this, so I'm very excited. So this is a, I think it's a really good representation. It's almost a miniature version of what's happening with the trunk. So we have a split that was coming down here. We have a uh, kind of a colorful side, and then we have a figured side over here. So I think this is gonna clean up really nicely and be an absolutely beautiful accent. So we'll be cutting this into veneer and laminating it down to a panel or a core, and that'll be our door panel and our back panel as well. So we'll uh, set this aside for now as we think about putting together the actual box or the carcass for this. And I have selected this uh, quarter sawn red oak, which I've had for over a decade. I think this is gonna be a good time to use that. This stuff uh, will be a nice kind of complement to the maple because it is so straight grained. It's, uh, it's not gonna detract from the panel a whole lot. It does have the quarter sawn ray fleck, which in red oak is a lot smaller, so that's kind of nice. So it's not going to take too much away from the, uh, the maple panel, which is a star of the show. So over here on my design board is what I came up with in just a few minutes of just kind of figuring out the size and scale for everything. So I grab a couple of bottles just to get an idea of how big bottles of things normally are, and a glass to get an idea of how big a uh, typical glass is. So based this design off of all the internal dimensions that I'm going to need for the things that go into the case. So up top we have a 14 inch tall area for a bottle that gives this a one inch of extra kind of airspace for a tall bottle. And then down here five inches for the area for the glasses. This one here is four inches tall and it's probably the biggest kind of glass you would have. So that also gives you some breathing room in there to be able to get in there and get your glass and whatnot. As far as the width goes, I laid these two bottles in here and uh, put a little space between them and I figured an inch on either side gives them some more space. And in case you have like a wider bottle, you can still fit two of them in there. So ideally two bottles and two glasses for the two of them. And that gave me an internal width of 10 inches. 
Now for the actual dimensions we need to build a project, I want to have a shelf in here and I want that to be a little bit thinner to give it a little bit of a visual scale. The material I'm starting with is five quarters, so I'm thinking I'll make the outer perimeter of the box uh, seven eighths of an inch thick and that'll give it a little bit of a heavier feel and then you'll have a delicate or more delicate shelf on the inside. So that's how I derive the overall dimensions for the outside. We're going to be doing through dovetails, so our boards are going to be the exact outside dimensions of, uh, of that cabinet, which makes the, the math easy. Now for the depth of the case, I felt like four inches is pretty good. This bottle here is about three and a half inches in diameter, so I'll give a little bit of extra breathing room inside of there. So here's how that depth stack up is going to work. So we have the four inches of internal dimensions. We have a door, which is going to be inset, so that's three quarters of an inch thick. I've given myself an allocation of three quarter inches for the back panel. Uh, that might end up a little bit thinner, but I'd rather kind of plan for it to be bigger right now. If it ends up thinner, the internal will just get bigger, which isn't a big deal. And then I have a half inch back here for a French cleat to hang on the wall. So our total depth is six inches, so that's the depth or the width that the boards are going to be cut to. So very simple, purpose-based kind of uh, planning for things. I think it should be a, this should be a fun little, little project. So let's, uh, let's figure out how much material we're going to need. I'm kind of guessing I might actually be able to get this entire project out of one of these boards, which is kind of a weird thought because I'm used to projects that take a lot more material than just one board. So this laid out surprisingly well. So side, top, second side, bottom, and shelf all on this one board and eliminating the uh, defects in this board, which is pretty crazy. So the only other uh, pieces that I need for this are going to be the door rails and styles. And I want to do some pretty narrow ones. So there is a pretty good chance that when I go to rip this to width, this is an eight inch wide board, that uh, I will have some strips along the side here that I can use for my door parts. So that's kind of a nice little thing, one board. A one board project, potentially? <laughs> well, well, we'll see. I have this one, which is a book match, and I have a whole another few boards after that, but pretty cool. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to go ahead and start doing my rough milling, get this thing chopped up and get it uh, flattened out initially, and we'll kind of get a better look at the actual grain after that process is all complete. So that cleaned up really nicely and it does have a nice kind of subtle wraith black in there. Here's a little mineral spirits to make it a little bit easier to see kind of at this stage. It's very subtle, which I like, but it does add a little bit of a kind of interest in there. So you can see some of the bigger wraith flecks through here. There's some smaller ones as you work out to the other side. But just kind of how you look at it in the light, you can see a little bit of flecking here and there, but overall, very straight grain, boring <laughs> panel, which is going to give a lot of interest or a lot of a lot of space for this to really shine. So next, I want to just kind of get this laid out, get it chopped up and flattened at least initially. So we're going to have two different size panels to kind of deal with. We're going to have the back panel, which is going to be the full size of the whole case, and then we have the door panel, which is going to be 
shrunk down by the size of the rails and styles. So I'm just going to make, I'm going to base mine off the back panel and then we can chop down the door panel later on once we get the veneering done. So to make it easy for rough numbers, I'm just going to use my outside dimensions and that's going to give me a little bit of a kind of leeway as I'm kind of laying things out. So I need a total length of about 21 inches long. I'm probably going to just clip off the checking down here and that's going to take me out into kind of this region up here where this chainsaw cut some guy hacked this apart <laughs> kind of starts and then I'm thinking to make this kind of visually interesting I'll put a straight edge onto this side and then have this side be a uh, void which will do a uh, epoxy encapsulation we do have this really awesome kind of fissure through here which we can stabilize with epoxy and then we'll have this kind of cavity over here surrounding a whole bunch of figure which is going to look uh, pretty darn awesome. So I need roughly 12 inches of width. So that's going to be all of this. And then I'm going to be into kind of here-ish. And this will kind of come down through here somewhere, somewhere in that kind of range there. So we'll have all this really interesting, fun color. We got a little bit of uh, rot to deal with. And then we have all of this curly area all around here surrounding this void. And if you take a look over here, we can actually see the curl as it was forming on the outside of the tree. So right here, you can see all the undulations in the wood itself. That is the curl presenting itself kind of on the outside of the tree. So this is all, all of this action through here is all figured and curly. And you can kind of see it through the rough sun grain on the face there. It's kind of visible, but now it should be more visible. Well, there we go. We got a little, so a little bit of figure <laughs> around here. I think this is going to be this incredible. So I'm going to go ahead and just give us a quick chop, uh, surface it the best I can without breaking it apart, and we'll let that sit for a little while before we do the uh, actual epoxy encapsulation. So I stopped a little bit early because I am starting to get a little bit of kind of chipping and tearing around some of this rotted area here. So I'm going to take a little pause now and stabilize the, uh, the rotted area so it doesn't get damaged as we're further planning it down to a more, you know, whatever thickness I'm going to do here. But this is, there's some really cool stuff going on here. I'm really excited about this. All of this kind of weird mossy stuff and the punky area there, I think it's going to be pretty darn awesome. So to stabilize that punky area, I'm going to use Total Boat's penetrating epoxy. This is going to be a very low viscosity epoxy, which is going to absorb really readily into those really punky areas, soak in really deep, and then harden and firm those areas up so then they can then be uh, planed down a little bit. And then as we go through the rest of the process, those areas are really hard and stabilized and ready to go. So this stuff is pretty easy to work with. It mixes up at a two to one ratio and uh, like usual I have no clue how much I'm actually going to need so I'm going to probably end up mixing more than one uh, batch of this. So let's see here. Let's do that. We'll do eight ounces-ish. So 
So you can see compared to a sort of regular epoxy, this is very loose, very fluid, very almost uh, water-like. And this might actually be too much. <laughs> So this is cured now, and this has actually firmed up pretty well, nice and hard now. So it's ready to be taken down to kind of final thickness and do its last little bit of cleanup. And I think I'm going to keep going with this maple crotch and get it as far through the process as possible because uh, one of the things with bringing this sort of thing into the project is this uh, makes things a little more interesting and challenging from a timeline perspective because Making these panels isn't really a whole lot of work from like an hour spent perspective, but there are, well, there's a lot of steps where each step has this uh, curing time involved. So I want to keep this process going as much as possible so things don't kind of stall up with the rest of the project. The other thing is that this panel actually needs its final thickness because it's going to set the actual width of our little shelf divider thing. So I get to get this panel made and ready before I'm able to actually rip my shelf to its final width. The rest of the joinery on the case is like an afternoon kind of thing, but we have probably like a week or so of waiting around for different steps to happen between uh, getting this thing into an encapsulated slab form, resawing it, and then veneering it, and then all the cure time for the veneering process onto the substrate. So there's a, there's a lot of sitting around uh, for the maple. So hopefully I'll be able to kind of bounce back and forth between uh, these panels and then the actual casework. So I have my form all ready to go and I am ready to start doing my casting. So I'm going to use Total Bowl's Thick Set, which is a casting resin as opposed to the coating resins, which we typically use for like, you know, glue ups and crack filling and stuff. These resins allow you to pour a thicker, a thicker pour uh, at one time versus the other ones, which can't really pour that thick, but these do have limits. So all the products are going to vary a little bit. This one does about an inch at a time. We're doing about two inches thick here, so we're doing some two pours, which isn't, uh, which isn't too bad, at least. So I already went ahead and I actually sealed my slabs. So I used the penetrating epoxy again and coated the entire thing. That's going to do kind of two things, one of which I actually care about, and that is going to be ghosting or bleeding of the casting resin into the wood. So now that the slab is completely sealed, it won't absorb any of the dye that I'm going to add into the casting. So that'll be nice. We'll be able to have nice crisp edges and crisp colors from where the wood meets the epoxy. The other thing it's gonna do is it's gonna prevent uh, any actual air bubbles and things from being released into the casting. Not a big deal for this casting because I'm doing an opaque casting. It's gonna be completely dark and not transparent at all. So I'm not really worried about being able to see bubbles down in there, but you know, just in case bonus points or something like that. So I am, uh, I'm guessing this is going to take about 50 to 60 ounces. So I'm going to mix up about 24 ounces to start with for our first pour. And we can kind of adjust uh, from there. And I'm going to put my slab in this side up. It would make more sense to put it in like this. But I do have some cracks and things on this side that I want to make sure get filled. This is the actual side that I want to uh, use. So this is probably going to be the actual door panel. go okay 
So this one mixes up at three to one. So I'm going to do 18 ounces of resin and then I'll do six ounces of the hardener. I'm using a black dye and I'm counting the drops that I put in there so that I can replicate the same mix for the, uh, the next pour. So that is 20 drops of black dye. Still kind of looks a little, maybe a little translucent. Let's add a few more. Okay, it's about 30 drops, and uh, I have a suspicion that this is not going to be enough. <laughs> yeah, this is not going to be anywhere near enough. <laughs> I think I got my estimate wrong. Very, very wrong. This is like only going to be half as much as I'm going to need. <laughs> that didn't go very far. All right, I'll mix up some more. Somebody's making a mess. So now while that first pour cures, I'm gonna go ahead and start working on the case joinery. So I have my rough boards, which I had milled uh, a couple of days ago. And I think, I don't think they moved at all. I'm gonna test them on the jointer and see if they're still flat. And if they are, I'm just gonna take them to the planter and take down a little more thickness. They're at a little over an inch right now. And I wanna finish off that seven eighths of an inch thick. And then once I'm finally down to my finished thickness, we're gonna go over to the table saw and make the rip cuts to get our six inch wide pieces for the case out of there. And then we can do our cross cuts to get our uh, pieces all down to final length and then we can uh, jump over to the bench and maybe uh, start doing some joinery. That'd be fun. All right, so we got our parts here all ready to go. We're gonna do some dovetails. So uh, with a wall hanging cabinet, the sides are gonna be the tailboards. That way when it's hanging there, the tails have their mechanical advantage doing something, holding up the sides. So this should be kind of fun. I'm gonna do some, uh, I'm gonna do some dovetailing. So I got a marking gauge here set to the thickness of the boards. I'm gonna run that around. And uh, I'm gonna use the bandsaw, <laughs> as always, to cut the, uh, the tails. That's gonna allow me to cut all the tails on all four corners at the same time with all the same settings and have them be all exactly the same. And I'll be uh, nice and symmetrical. So just to give myself a little bit of a uh, guideline as I head over to the bandsaw, I'm gonna do three tails and uh, that's the layout.
So as you can see, then the first two uh, connections are ready. That makes this last one, or the last two, pretty easy to transfer because they're all just kind of laid out all nice for you. Okay, that takes care of our dovetail box. Let's go uh, check on the epoxy. All right, this is looking pretty nice. It's actually set up pretty well. It's just a little bit past the point of being tacky. It's uh, still soft, but it's not sticky. And uh, it's actually did a really nice job of degassing by itself. I don't see any, any bubbles or any kind of oddities on the surface anywhere. So I got uh, another batch of epoxy mixed up and uh, I don't know, maybe I messed up with my estimation because it's literally double what I thought it was. So maybe I didn't factor in the thickness or, or something. Okay, let's see what happens. Okay, I think that's going to be it for now, so we'll, uh, we'll check back in on this thing in uh, a few days. So it's been about a week and this is all set up and cured now. I'm actually really impressed with how well this thing degasses by itself. There really isn't a whole lot of, you know, uh, bubbles and defects that you can see there. So that's always kind of a nice plus. I forgot to wrap this block. All right, we'll deal with that later. I'm a little stronger than I realize, I guess.
That is, oh, this is gonna be really cool. Oh, all right. Now I'm, I'm getting excited. All right, there's our block, all ready to be made into uh, some veneer. So after a bit of work, we have our veneer. We're ready to make a little lasagna sandwich thing. The, uh, the bandsaw didn't quite like the, uh, the epoxy today. It was kind of gumming up the side of the blade and that caused it to rub and to drift on me a little bit, but uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. I got through it, I got my veneers, and uh, <laughs> a lot of the big block I had ended up in the, uh, the drum sander, but whatever. It doesn't really matter, because what the hell, what am I, what else, what else am I gonna do with uh, that kind of offcut. So as I was kind of laying these things out, I just wanted to make sure that my uh, my book match that I actually care about is going to be from the inside of the case to the inside of the doors. So when you open the door, you have a book match between those two pieces. So I made sure to label all my pieces so I knew which side I'm gonna be putting glue on and which side, which two veneers go together on the same panel. And also to kind of keep that in mind as I'm putting everything together here so I don't screw this up, you know, too, <laughs> too badly. So because we have epoxy in our panel for the uh, adhesive for this uh, veneer job, we're gonna use Total Bow's traditional five to one. So this is a, the same epoxy I would use for any kind of glue up. This will actually adhere to the epoxy, adhere to my substrate and work out uh, really nicely as a, um, as a veneer glue. So I don't know how much I'm gonna need of this, so probably like at least one pump per panel, maybe two. I don't know, I can always mix more. Let's do four for now. Then we'll get our little sandwich panel thing all put together. I am going to try and glue all of these into, or glue all of these at once. <laughs> so uh, wish me luck on that one. Biggest thing I have to worry about is them you know, sliding around and whatnot. Oh, this is probably not gonna be enough. But for, anyway, but anyway, for our substrate, I got some uh, Baltic birch plywood. So that'll be our core veneer. And then the veneers themselves are just a hair under an eighth of an inch thick, somewhere kind of in, you know, that three millimeter range for all you metric folk, maybe like 2.7, I don't know, <laughs> somewhere in that region, this is not, not going to be enough. Okay, this is how I'm going to do this to hopefully minimize the chances of screwing this up. Open these up, apply the glue to this side, put my substrate in the middle, and then fold it back together. That should eliminate error. But uh, 
it's me, so yeah, no promises. Okay, so now I can drop on my substrate, which maybe I'll just put a little, get a little bit of epoxy in there. I don't know. Probably not necessary, but it makes me feel good. Okay, put that in here. Boop. Okay, there's that. And repeat the same process again. Open it up, glue it up. Put some top here. I'm going to have a couple pieces of the same plywood here, which I'm going to use as a top platen. And I think what I'll probably do is I'll pull a vacuum, get it all kind of smooshed together, and then I'll open it up again. Just see make sure I can shift it around too much. Okay, let me do a little double check here. It looks like it's lined up just fine. I think it's close enough. Close enough that I can adjust things because the only, well, even the, between the door and the, um, the back, they're different sizes. So I can always adjust the cuts a little bit to get them uh, even. So I don't know, looks good, whatever. Close enough. One's not like hanging halfway off. That's all I really care about. So good enough. Let's get it going for real. And I'll just leave the pump running and have it under vacuum until the epoxy cures. So that'll be sometime tomorrow. Next day, it's been about it's been about 18 hours or so. Let's see uh, see how this went. Hopefully, it worked. It's on there. Yeah. There you go. Got that guy on there. There's that one. Ow. Very sharp. Had a little bit of squeeze out onto here. Oh. 
that also worked. This is really good. So that's the, uh, this is the back of the cabinet panel and this is the door panel. So this will be the outside of the cabinet and then you open the door, you'll have the inside of the door panel and the inside of the cabinet. And then the back is just, that's gonna be against the wall and it's just there to kind of, just to equalize the veneering on both sides of the panel. So that's exciting. I'm gonna clean these up a little bit, just kind of square them off and get rid of some of these sharp corners so a little bit nicer to work with. And then uh, we can get back to some actual work. So if the panel's out of the way and we have a final thickness on that, it's gonna make it a lot easier to get our divider size correctly to go in here. So uh, we're gonna start working on the inside stuff. So of course we need a groove in the back there for this panel to go into. And then we need some way to join this thing inside of this box. And there's a lot of different ways you can join this divider in here. If this was a much larger box and looking for a lot of structure, uh, a wedged through tenon is gonna be really great because if you look at the structure of this, you have the dovetails on the sides, the tails are resisting gravity. So you have the mechanical advantage of the tails as the cabinets hang on the wall, but mechanically there isn't a whole lot tying it together side to side. So something like a wedge through tenon is gonna lock the two sides in place and not allow them to come apart at all. For something this small, that is uh, <laughs> not, not a concern at all. So a, an easier way would be cool. Not that I don't wanna do a through tenon here, but I'm not really, I wanna do something easy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you wanted to, you could do any sort of uh, floating joinery method. You can use dowels or biscuits or dominoes in here to install this thing in here. Uh, a, even just setting it in a dado would be technically fine as well because you don't need a whole lot of structure from this thing. I'm gonna do what I typically do in this scenario and I'm gonna do a crenellated tenon because that's just kind of what I feel like doing right now, which is essentially a box joint just out here in the middle here. So I'll put some little tenons onto the end of this piece and they'll go into mortises in here and that'll be our, our joinery for that. So I'm gonna get this thing taken apart and start running through that process. This divider still needs to go down to final thickness. I can cut the final size and then I'll go through and just make a quick uh, crenellated tenon type of thing.
Cranolator Morrison Tannin. Uh, definitely overkill for this build, but man, that is a, uh, a fun bit of joinery to execute. I had fun at least. So the next thing to think about or worry about, I guess, is going to be the door. So I have these offcuts from when we ripped the case sides to width and I'm kind of thinking I'm going to use these. I think normally these would be a little bit on the narrow side for a door frame, but I think because my case sides are a little bit thicker and heavier looking, a thinner door frame might look okay. And the other thing that's kind of driving this is the less door frame I have, the more panel I'll have in the door. So I'm just going to use these. I could cut some wider stuff from more stock, but you know, let's just go ahead and, uh, use these things. So this is just going to be a very simple frame and panel door. So we need uh, some grooves in our frame pieces for the panel to go into. And then we can just join them together. And I think I'm just going to use some dominoes for that. The other kind of thing in the back of my mind with this door frame too, is that it's going to get a little bit smaller as well, because I want to make this door oversized for my opening. That way I have some material there to trim it and fit it down to final size. So there is the door and I'm actually really happy with the really narrow rails and styles. I think up against the side of the case, it ends up kind of bulking out to what a standard size style and rail would be, but you have much more panel. I think having a wider style and rail would make this panel super duper small and look kind of, kind of odd. So I'm, uh, I'm really pleased with this. So one more thing I want to do before moving forward any further is to hinge the door or at least cut the mortises into the case for the hinges because with something this small, it's gonna be not that much fun to mortise into the case for the hinges once it's all assembled. So if I can do that now, that'll save me a little bit of a heartache later. So I have been kind of going back and forth on which way I wanna hinge this and I'm thinking I wanna put the hinges on the right side because uh, I'm feeling a little well, fun. Normally, at least for me, I feel like most of my stuff ends up being left hand kind of swing, but I'm going to switch things around when you go right hand swing. Now, one small little issue, and this is a uh, pretty indicative of the type of project that I'm making is I haven't ordered hinges yet. So I'm going to go ahead and make a withdrawal, <laughs> but my collection of Horton Brass's butt hinges, my little cache of them. And uh, we'll use this guy for now until I actually get those ordered. It's kind of nice to have a set of 16 hinges that you can just use whenever you need one or two. So typically the hinges are going to be aligned with the top of the bottom or the bottom of the top rail right in here. So I'm going to use the spacer block here just to set my, uh, my mortise location on the case. 
just to make that uh, pretty easy. So I'm gonna go ahead and lay this out and mortise in for the leaf into the, uh, the case side. And that'll be, I think about it for woodwork stuff, working wood stuff. Okay, I should take care of all of the construction related stuff. So all of our parts are technically done and we can start thinking of the next steps, which you know, most of the time would be, let's get into some assembly next, but I'm thinking one step ahead of that, I'm thinking about finishing because it'd be a lot easier to apply finish to these panels while they're open and free like this than when they're actually you know, inside of a frame or inside of a case. So it's like, well, no big deal. You can just apply some finish to these now, glue up the case and apply finish to the rest of the case later. Uh, that also sounds terrible <laughs> because once these panels are finished and assembled into the case, I don't want to get any more finishing applications and stuff anywhere near this panel, which could potentially screw up the finishing job I'm going to do on the panel. So the solution here is actually to pre-finish all of the interior parts of all the pieces and leave all of the exterior uh, surface prep and finishing for the future because we still want to be able to flush up our dovetails and clean up all of the corners and that stuff so the outsides we can leave for later but as far as I'm concerned I'm going to pre-finish all the internal components of everything everything that's going to be in contact with the panels which will also be uh, pre-finished so I'm going to just start getting into some finishing work now and the kind of the biggest, more involved thing here is going to be, of course, the panels because they're a little more challenging and complicated to finish prep and get ready for finish because they have so much epoxy in them. So I'm going to go through and actually sand them and essentially polish them. So normally most of my stuff, if it's just wood, I would just sand to 180 grit and apply my finish with the epoxy. Uh, probably, usually I go a little higher than that, a lot higher than that. Um, I have... Uh, incremental standing discs up to 800 so I'm just gonna go ahead and use all of those grits and run all the way through uh, one critical thing you'll find when you're sanding and polishing epoxy is that any little um, dust nib or like granule or some little bit of sandpaper that may get stuck on the surface if you go to your next grit you could end up with some swirlies in there from a coarse grit getting stuck between the sander and your workpiece so between every grit, I go through and I'll clean the surface before proceeding with the next sanding grit. I just make sure that the surface is completely clean and there's no grime or junk in the way, which is gonna screw up my sanding effort. So this is where I started, that's 80 grit. This is sanded to 800 grit. And let's just take a closer look at how the epoxy sort of looks in that state. So you can see at 800 grit, a very nice uniform kind of more, I don't know, crisper looking color. You come down here to the 80 grit, eh, it's going to be really hazy, obviously. Now the polishing process is far less important on, you know, something like this. We have a totally opaque epoxy, but if you're trying to do anything clear, yeah, you're going to be having to pay far more attention to polishing and getting these things looking perfect. So even at 80 grit, you can kind of tell that it's a little bit on the hazy side, but of course it's only 80 grit. I probably didn't have to go to 800, but 
I have 800 papers, so I might as well use it. All right, we got a nice cut of finish on all the parts. So now we can start on some assembly. All right, so for the glue up, I'm gonna be using epoxy uh, for you know, some of the usual benefits, but for also one uh, particular need, I guess, in this case. So the usual benefits, uh, longer working time, so I don't really have to worry about getting this thing together uh, too quickly and uh, just less stress overall. Who needs stress? Uh, you also have the uh, the benefit here. We got some dovetails. We got some tighter fitting joinery. The epoxy will lube up without swallowing the fibers, so it's going to be a lot easier for all this to uh, slip together. It's going to slide together a lot more easily than it did when it was dry, which is uh, a nice little side benefit. Now, the real reason I'm using epoxy for this is because I had these epoxy uh, veneer panels, and I want the panels to adhere to the grooves inside of the case because those panels are going to give these case pieces a lot of rigidity especially with the door being so uh, narrow having that piece of uh, plywood in there essentially is going to strengthen the entire door and give it a lot more strength similar to how my uh, tool cabinet is it's just a framed out piece of plywood the plywood is adhered to the frame and becomes one integral unit, giving it a lot of support so it's not gonna have any tendency to sag because that piece of, that panel piece is an integral part of the whole structure of the whole thing. So to make this a little bit more organized for me, I'm gonna take my door parts and set these aside. I'll do these second. I don't wanna mess those up by accident. And then I'll get the case glued up first and then I'll come back and get the, uh, the door put together. Way out of square. <laughs> Way out. Okay, case is good. Let's do the door next.
biggest thing with these doors is you want them to be completely flat in the clamps. Otherwise, if you do glue them up at some kind of twist or weird shape, they're not going to be very easy to fit into that uh, case. They're going to be all over the place. So you want a nice flat door to fit into the flat opening that we created in the case. That is looking pretty good. Let me just check it for square. Good. All right, let's leave it alone. Don't touch. So the glue up was successful. I wasn't really worried about that, but now I don't have to worry about touching my panels ever again. They're all finished and done and completely off the list. So we have the outsides to kind of flush up and clean up and that can get uh, finish applied to. And the, the door can get flushed up as well at this point and ready for finish once it gets fit to the opening. So that is what I'm gonna start working on next is getting this to fit inside of this hole. So it did end up a little bit bigger. So that's a, that's a nice thing. So I'm gonna start getting the fitting going on here. So the first thing I'll do is I'll set the bottom square to the side. We'll see kind of where that's at because there is a very good chance that the geometry of these two rectangles is not the same. So now with my hinge side pressed up into the case, I can kind of get it in here and sight down and see how my actual angle on here is going to work when it's down into the case. So I am tight here at the corner and I have a small gap on this side. So I want to adjust my cut so I take more material off of this side and create a little bit of a taper on here to get the door parallel to the bottom. I'm using my hinge side for all these cuts since that's the side which is going to be fixed to the case. And I'll just adjust the angle onto the bottom of the, uh, the door with the shim. And as I'm working, I'll mark the location of the shim on the door frame so I can repeat this cut at that exact angle again later on. And while I'm at it, I'll also do the same thing for the top to get that angle figured out. So the top is sitting in here really nicely. So I got that angle figured out. The bottom is all set as well. So next I want to work towards getting the hinges on here. So I want to use the same angle and remove just a little more material off the top and bottom. So this thing actually goes in here and I'm gonna start trimming down the sides a little bit. Uh, I'm not gonna set my gaps until I have it actually hung on the hinges since the hinges really fix it in place. But I'm gonna get this thing in here really close and then we can get the, uh, the hinges onto the door. So as I was working, I was trying to remove the same uh, material from all sides with one kind of big exception, and that is the hinge side here. I actually removed more material from this style than this style because once I get this thing onto the hinges, get those hinges mortised in there, I'm not going to be setting my gap on this side at all. That's going to be set by the hinges. I'll be making my gap setting on this side. So I want to have more material over here than over here because I'll be removing more material from this side later on and this side's gonna stay the same. So that should help to keep all the styles and rails at roughly the same width, at least visually, so you can't tell a difference when you're looking at it. So we're gonna start getting the, uh, the mortises set in the door for the hinges. So these hinges have a preset gap in them. So when you close the leaves together, when they're parallel, there is a gap between them. And in this case, this is about an eighth of an inch and for the stuff that I like to do, an eighth of an inch for a gap around a door for a cabinet like this is a little big for me at least. So I tend to go a little bit of a tighter gap. So I'll actually mortise the leaves into the door a little bit deeper and that will reduce the gap set by the hinges so I have a tighter gap tolerance. So all I'm gonna do here is transfer the location of the hinge mortises from the case onto the doors, make my mortises for the hinges and then we can recheck and start actually fitting the door uh, perfectly to set those gaps. Well, the door is already set perfectly, but we haven't set the gaps yet.
So with the hinges in there, I just want to make sure that my angle, my top and bottom haven't changed at all. And that looks perfectly straight across. Bottom looks good too. So all I have to do now is set the gap over here on the left side and just widen up the gap here along the top and bottom so it matches what's going on here by the hinges. So we'll have this uniform gap all the way around. I still have my uh, shim locations marked so I can repeat the exact angled cuts on the top and bottom relative to the hinge side. And then I will start removing material from the left side to get that uh, swinging style at the same gap as the hinge side. All right, let's see where that brought us to. A little tight up here still. Gap on the top looks pretty good. Gap on the bottom looks pretty good. So just over here is all we have to deal with still. So over here, we have a little too much material on top and we have a little bit missing down here at the bottom. I want to make sure I can get this door tolled into the case before I decide how wide that gap is going to be. So I'm going to pull this off and just do a little planning on this side to create a little bit of a taper on here so that uh, this door actually goes into the opening and then we can actually assess what the, uh, the current gap status is once this door is fully inside the case. more and it looks like the case side actually bows out slightly so I'm going to focus more on the ends too. Pretty darn close, I'd say. That ain't bad. So the gap is a little bit too small up here. It looks pretty good through the middle and down through the bottom. So I think I just need to tweak this one little area up here and then this should be good. I'll also at this point go ahead and add my back bevel on here. That's gonna make it go into the opening a little bit easier because at this point when it comes into the case right here, it's actually across this diagonal. So it's technically wider at this moment than it is when it's fully in the case. So putting a little back bevel on here, just make sure this doesn't end up contacting the side of the case, which is really helpful when you have pretty tight tolerance gaps. So a couple quick little tweaks and then we're ready for some, some kind of pulley doodad. <laughs> so this is what I came up with a pull. So let me just walk you through a little thought process of making this uh, stock for this little grabber doohickey thing with bobber. So I had a block of Clara Walnut that my friend Pablo gave me many years ago. Give me several of these blocks and uh, they're pretty handy for kind of odd things like this. They have some interesting figure in a lot of them so uh, pulling off a chunk of that is perfect for something like this. I started out with a blank that was an inch wide and about a quarter inch thick and I knew I wanted some kind of curved profile on the end, so I used a part of the gooseneck scraper to give me a curve that I liked, and then I went over to the sander and just sanded down to the lines. Now this is when I got to thinking like, it'd be kind of nice if there was a little recessed area in there for your fingers to actually feel and grab onto. So uh, a little bit of carving I think will make a pretty quick little uh, indent divot thing in there. So I used a large gouge to set the I guess the initial starting point of everything. And then I just use another gouge to just kind of dig down and create sort of a fan pattern, uh, deepening or ramping down to that initial um, gouge line, just to create sort of like a little, little ramp, fanned out effect. And I'm thinking as I'm working on this, one of the nice things about carving with gouges is it does leave some tool marks. So I think actually leaving the tool marks in the pull is going to be a nice touch. So when you, so when you grab the handles, open the door, 
you actually feel something in there. So once I had that initial concept kind of figured out, I took it over to the case to see how it would fit as far as scale goes. And I had originally set this up with a three quarter inch protrusion past the front of the door, which is, uh, it feels a little big. So I think maybe about a half inch is probably a sweet spot for this. So in order to get that kind of shrunken down a little bit, I can take some of that off of the front. I had way too much material up the front. So I just sand back a little bit in the front. And then I can also reduce the thickness of the entire pole. And that because of that ramp effect on that pole area is going to also make it a little less uh, protruding past the front because the ramp will start at a further off distance or at a closer distance. So that is the, uh, the completed little pole stock. I really like this texture in here. It's uh, pretty nice. I went through and scared thing a, uh, a decent sanding. I broke all the kind of corners and edges just to give it a nice soft rounded profile and feel and it, uh, it's feeling super nice. So that is the stock that's going to get essentially mortised into here. So we'll cut a little slot in here and that'll be our pull just kind of sticking out past the front of the door. Now there's also one more little sneaky thing I'm gonna do here. And this actually started back before uh, assembly. If I take a magnet. <laughs> so uh, back before I assembled this, I epoxied a magnet into the underside of the shelf. I cut a little slot in there, epoxied in a magnet so I could do this uh, now. So one of the things I'm, I'm kind of going for with this is sort of a hidden door catch fastener system. So I'm going to epoxy a matching magnet into the door into a, a slot in here. And that slot's going to be hidden behind this pull. So you won't see the slot or anything. Now one thing that was sort of on my mind with this is the location of this pull, because if I put it in line with this divider, which would cover that slot, it puts that way down here, but I actually kind of like it way down here because especially once this is up on a wall, I think this is going to be a nice comfortable location to grab it from. So I think it's going to work out pretty well. So before I start getting this all in here, I'm going to actually take this door off and finish sand it so I can get it all ready to go. Then I can cut in my little mortisey thingy for my pull, roughly at the same elevation as the shelf or the divider, or whatever we're calling it. And then from there, I can epoxy in that magnet so I can cut a slot for that magnet. And uh, I'll glue it in there and hopefully it all kind of works out because I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited about this sneaky concept. So I was originally planning on epoxying this magnet in here, but I'm, I think I can just let it float in there because I'm going to cap it off with this thing anyway. So it's not like <laughs> it's not like it's going to be able to go anywhere. So I'm just going to go ahead and glue this thing on here and that should be just about it for uh, this whole thing. That's exciting. I'm excited. Almost done. Okay, one last look to make sure it's all fitting and looking good. And I think this is good to go. So Time for a little bit of finish prep because it's all sanded, get all the joinery flushed up and uh, break all the edges. And then we'll get to seeing these uh, Rayflex really pop out of the wood. I'm looking forward to seeing some finish on here and just seeing it all kind of together as one completely finished piece versus something that's half finished and half unfinished. Clock your screws, don't clock your screws. I don't really care.
all done. Okay, for real now, the last thing is to install the French cleat on the back. So I took a scrap piece, planed it down to the right thickness to fit down in here, and ripped it on a bevel to get uh, two pieces that uh, interlock. These are at uh, 45 degrees. One piece is gonna be attached here to the case. I had that fit in here pretty nicely. And the other piece is left free. You can mount this to the wall and then they can just hang it up pretty easily. I like to cut the piece that goes on the wall a little bit narrower than the case. So it's a bit easier to slide this thing up onto the wall and catch the cleat on the wall and get it to come down and seat. So a couple screws or three screws in here and then it's officially done. Like officially. Donezo. 100%. I haven't been this happy with how well a project turned out in a long time. And for me at least, we've been working on the house for so long, I haven't been spending much time in the shop. So this was a great way for me to get out here, and do something creative, uh, actually get some woodworking done, do some more joinery and do the things that I actually enjoy. This, is a, this was a really good way to keep, uh, keep sane while trudging through the process of renovating our house. So for that purpose, it is a, uh, definitely served that really well. I'm also really excited to give this to our neighbors because I think they're absolutely gonna love it. The history of their tree is here preserved for them. So I'm really looking forward to giving it to them and showing them their tree looking a little different than it did uh, many, many years ago. I'm also super, super happy with this little catch thing. I think that's like the coolest thing ever. And oh man, the figure on this side of the tree, absolutely incredible and I think it's a really cool pairing against the, uh, the more rotted and colorful sides. So this is a really cool tree, and I'm, I'm really glad that it has become something that uh, I think some will cherish for a very long time. So that is gonna do it for this one. Thank you as always for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments on the, uh, whatever this is called, the scotch cabinet, whiskey cabinet, wall hanging cabinet, put whatever you want in a cabinet, please feel free to leave me a comment. As always, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time, <laughs> happy working. Do you notice that? Because the door fits so well, it's got a little of an air cushion. As it's coming in, it slows down, and then the catch grabs. <laughs>